but to completely just take her out and say you can no longer be active yeah because of this thing that you have going on in your foot uh that is not a very legitimate diagnosis just kind of hurt me on many levels you're listening to the restoring human movement podcast where movement experts discuss the latest evidence-based practices to help you and your clients move with mastery and now your host dr sebastian gonzalez hey everyone it's dr sebastian jolis your host with the restoring human movement podcast thanks for joining the movement movement this is your first time on the show welcome This is going to be about an hour format of listening to me interview the guy that you just heard on the little snippet. So this is a student. This is student interview number four. This is of a chiropractic student. His name is Curtis Gerba. Gerba. I'm going to say it wrong, and he's going to correct me. So that's G-R-Y-B-A. And so uh, you can look look him up on Instagram. It's E3 Mobility. And... uh, so if you have not already heard the other student interviews, the whole point was to actually uh, be able to learn what, what they're learning or not learning from this podcast. So I've really uh, been attempting to improve the podcast over the last year or especially after about 120. And um, I want to I want to learn how to improve it. So if you guys are listeners, obviously, if you are, you're listening to this, then um, email me at seb at p2sportscat.com or reach out on Instagram. That's at performance HB and just let me know. Now, if this is your first time to the podcast, again, um, typically uh, what the what the goal of this podcast is, is to improve the uh, relationship between doctor and patient. And so I really attempt to, we're trying to boil down our communication and improve our um, ability to communicate what is needed to the patient to get them better. And so if you're a patient, this is not necessarily going to be extremely technical. There might be a couple words you don't necessarily know, but we'll try to clean those things up. Imagine we're all at a bar having a beer. Let's say it's called West Coast IPA from Green Flash, and there's two docs, and let's just say a mailman today. And so we try to make things extremely easy for the mailman, uh, and uh, hopefully the mailman will feel better. Now, um, typically I'll share a little bit about myself via personal story, just so you guys can get to know your host, because I do believe you should... Uh, know your host and like your host or else you can go to a different show so let me share that right now and we will get right into the interview so back when i was in chiropractic school i um had this table and probably all the chiropractors know about the astrolite tables and so you can imagine what it was and they don't sell them anymore but for the most part like this table it's fairly cushy and comfy and so at the time like people were I don't know why, but we, I was talking to people who were who were uh, kind of like trying to one-up you on stories about how hard their life has been. And so like, well, you don't understand, like someone paid for your college. And uh, I'm like, well, someone paid for my grad school. And they're like, um, I'm like, no one paid for my grad school. And they'll say, well, you know, no one paid for my college, you know. And I had to start working at the age of 16 and blah, 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 and so on. And so I started thinking, I'm like, how can I one-up these people? I'm like, you know what? I can sleep in a cardboard box for a month. And so I thought, I'm like, well, I don't really want to sleep outside, but I can probably make get some cardboard boxes and make a little tunnel around this table that, uh, I mean, I could sleep on the table in a house in a cardboard box and legitimately say, legitimately say that I've slept in a cardboard box every night for a month. I didn't eventually do it, but I thought, you know, this would be something cool to say, kind of like burning a passport, you know, but uh, never did it. But just the thought, if you guys ever want to say that, you can legitimately say it if you do it, even if you're inside a house, just don't disclose that last part. Okay, now into the content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, right now, it's the only thing keeping me cold during the night, geez. Oh, yeah. How hot yeah. is it? How hot is it? Um, well, I'm Canadian, so I go in Celsius. Um, <laughs> of course you non-free- do <laughs> non-freedom units um, uh, but it's been like in the 30s like consistently in the 30s so I guess like 90s ish yeah and not really getting any colder during the night like it would go down like four degrees over like during the course of the night wait for celsius degrees or for fahrenheit degrees uh, four celsius degrees that's a, that's a big degrees that's like 10 degrees isn't it <laughs> wow, I, I don't know. I think I have to like double it and then add. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but to get to get the difference, I think you uh, say it's twenty degrees Celsius. I think you double it and add thirty. 
32 probably think 32 because there's a there's a 32 for some reason on the uh on on the on the freezing point for water right 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 (laughs) so we're actually live on here oh no kidding perfect we we can cut stuff too if you want to but i find that especially in the beginning um i've been trying to do a better job of actually just if if there's it seems like there's good interaction prior to actually talking about stuff (laughs) yeah ceiling fans and freedom units yeah that's what people care about you know it's good stuff absolutely yeah so is there anything you want to talk about today um i was doing some thinking a little bit before and i think a couple things that really stood out to stood out to me to kind of touch on uh and all the reading that i'm doing making sure that you have like your wife behind what you're doing i think is really important Mm -hmm. and also i think that one thing in especially like the physical and like rehab world the whole idea of nocebo excuse me, nocebos is kind of getting a little, like it's almost taken being taken a little too far where people are getting worried to say no to really like damn it, potentially damaging exercises for people who just don't have that capability yet. Okay. Yeah. We can definitely explore those things. So, um, you, uh, here's the kind of rules of the game here, by the way, everyone, this is, this is Curtis. How do you say your last name? Gribba. Gribba. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like it very manly. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so here's actually there is no rules in this game. You can we can edit out, edit out anything you want. Just let me know later. Um, Sounds good. You can back and forth conversation because I know how hard it is to be interviewed. Uh, um, okay. So it's a it's spitball, but um, I thought the the premise of this. If you you have you heard the other student interviews? Yes, yes I have. Okay, and so it's just. Uh, Kind of like that. <laughs> um, Perfect. Sounds good. Yeah. So uh, tell everyone about yourself, where you're going to school, what kind of coffee you're drinking. Is it dark, medium, uh, or light roast? Okay. Um, so my name is Curtis Gribba. I am a Canadian chiropractic student from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I am going to school in Portland, excuse me, Portland, Oregon, at the University of Western States. Um we go in quarters, not trimesters, and we go year-round. Uh, so I am in my eighth quarter. Uh, just started working in the clinic. Got a, a five or six patient visits under my belt. Um, quite, I am quite a drinking. Bit there. <laughs> it's uh, it's been a couple busy weeks actually. Um, I I've been lucky enough that lower quarter students have been requesting to come see me in clinic um i'm a rep for the motion palpation institute so i think that's uh, kind of helped a little bit as well mm. to just be you know have the opportunity to put myself you know in front of lower students once a week uh, at lunch and kind of you know just they kind of expose myself and hopefully you know entice entice people to come see me yeah that is part of the whole game is uh you got to get people to come yeah, absolutely. Um, um, yeah, what kind of coffee is that again? Uh, this is, I'm drinking it black. It is a mixture of a few different blends because I go to the bulk section at either Winkle or Fred Meyers and just kind of dabble in whatever smells good. <laughs> You're the smell guy. There was, yeah. uh, uh, I had owned a coffee roasting business for a while, and so I was investigating okay. all the, yeah, it, no more, but... Um, yeah. I become a real coffee snob, and okay. so I started realizing all those different, you know, all the different ty- uh, profiles of, of roasting is like city, full city, full city plus, uh, oh. French, French, uh, all that kind of stuff. I think I have a couple different blends of a blonde roast going on in here, but that's the extent of my knowledge. Yeah, there's. Uh, I didn't realize how how deep it all went until getting into that. <laughs> yeah. For sure, you really, really had to dive down the rabbit hole. Yeah, why? Um, why did you get into motion palpation? I'm just curious. Um, for me, there was a couple different things that really kind of drove me into it. Um, I went to a couple seminars, and first of all, Corey Campbell. I don't think there's any better person to take my first seminar from. Mm-hmm. Um, just incredibly talented, and has the same humor that I do. That of pretty much a 15 year old 
PBS employee. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I, every seminar I've taken three seminars from him now. And at the end of every single seminar, he goes into this whole chat about how much chiropractic means to him, about how it's been given in the, the opportunity to support his family, to have a really positive impact on people's lives and given him the opportunity to put himself and meet students like us. Mm -hmm. And during every one of those speeches, no matter how or where it is, he gets so passionate and so, you know, worked up about that every single time he gets teared up. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, you know, that was a very kind of eye opening experience for me to have an opportunity to learn and be surrounded by people just that passionate about this profession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there, um, I was also very fortunate enough to have uh, an upper quarter student kind of take me under her wing. And she, uh, she ended up also being a motion palpation Institute rep. And, you know, through her, I just saw all the benefits of how her confidence built and how she grew throughout her time in school. And when she kind of offered me her rep position to me at that point, it just became a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Did, um, so I think on the, the idea of confidence there, I think that's a big point too, is the, so you, you feel much more confident now having those skills. Um, Absolutely. do you see other students that are around you too, having this, the same confidence or do you guys even talk about that? Or I don't think we did when we were in school really. I think uh, getting that confidence is a huge deal because there's a, there's a kind of a group of us, probably 10 or 15, who will consistently put in like extra time during lunch, go to clubs such as MPI or our R2P and everything like that. And then as we went into clinic uh, just a few weeks ago, it was you were really able to tell the people that were that were confident going in. Obviously, the whole part of it was in the profession that we chose, we're always going to be learning stuff. There's always going to be room for improvement. But you could definitely tell the people that were confident in their ability, ability to go in and perform the skills that we have, perform the skills that we have learned, be able to go through the neuros for cervicals, lumbar, the, the neuro and orthos for cervicals and lumbars, you know, and be confident with our ability to adjust the patient and to give adequate rehab for the areas of comfort that we currently have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it's, I remember having the first few patients at, at clinic, I remember that the the interaction was it was it was not as easy as I thought it was going to be, and the history taking no. was not as easy as I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, go go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say my first patient. Like I showed up to my first shift in clinic after we got our like clinical entrance exam done, and my clinician looks at me and she's like, "Hey, do you want a patient?" And I'm like, oh, "Absolutely, <laughs> I want a patient. Like, let's go." <laughs> and then I ended up. It was uh, it was a student patient, and I knew exactly what the person was coming in for. And I just had this moment of like, oh, my God, not this one. Because um, <laughs> everybody that I've known come before, like um, my friends who ended up passing me her position as rep to MPI, and the girl before her who gave her position rep to, uh, like rep position to MPI, all had these uh, shoulder cases given to them. And for some reason, we don't, we only start learning like our shoulder orthos and neuros while we're already in clinic. Oh, really? Oh, you, this yes. is, you just, you don't know what the, what the hell to do yeah, with this so person. <laughs> I looked and was like, I have a shoulder case coming in. And like, I know like from all the, like I'm a seminar junkie. So from all the seminars I've done, like I can rehab the shoulder. No problem. But if you ask me to do the six or seven different ortho tests that we need, then we're going to have some issues. <laughs> but the great thing about it is that the entire time we have, like, we have secondaries in the room with us and we get paired up with upper quarter secondaries who have been doing this, you know, have been in that clinic system for a year plus. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're just kind of helping me, okay, do this test, do this test, do this test. And, you know, uh, based on the tests, I was able to come to the proper diagnosis. Clinician agreed with me. Treatment went on. We were happy campers from then on out. Mm -hmm. So you're pretty seamless at shoulders now? 
Uh, there's still a lot to, as far as the, as, again, as far as learning the neuros and the orthos, uh, s- still room to grow. And obviously with the rehab and everything, there's always going to be more to learn. But I've kind of dove down the DNS rabbit hole. I've dove down into, you know, the functional range systems with FR and FRC. Mm-hmm. So once I can kind of get a general idea of, you know, am I dealing with uh, scapular stability issue? Am I learning with, if, am I working with a shoulder that just doesn't work like a shoulder? Like, do we have just gross you have a range of motion issues? I kind of know the areas that I can dive down to and where to add stability and where to add mobility and kind of work in through there. Mm-hmm. Well, at least that, like, I, I mean, my, my observation with like a lot of, let's just say knees, shoulders are kind of the, I think same in this is that it, it seems like in, in a lot of times, aside from trauma being like a wild card, it, I feel like, yeah. I mean, the diagnosis is there. It's like a chopped up, like bit of whatever we want to call it, but it's kind of like yeah. it, it, I feel like a lot of them kind of get there the same way. Um, yeah, absolutely. Or similar ways, and um, I remember I did the um, I I did the uh, DACBSP, and okay. So in there, there was a there was an examination station. So there was upper, mm-hmm. there was concussion, there was lower, and blah blah blah. And so it was the upper yeah. station, and mm-hmm. so I actually failed that, and mm-hmm. I didn't quite understand why. And so I went back the second time and took this thing and. Uh, you you can obviously get shoulder wrist whatever um i ended up mm-hmm. getting a wrist the second time but oh, okay uh, but i was thinking that as i went through uh, I, I i wrote this whole like pissed off manuscript of like all of the tests that i would do all the sensitivity specificity here's the re- documentation for it so if they ever came a problem a problem again like i failed it i was just gonna throw it at them yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> so I, yeah. Became, I became pretty good at shoulder exams and after that one <laughs> yeah I think that might be have to might be a route that I have to take to get my examination and orthos down. But one thing I've in a couple of the seminars that I've taken, uh, one thing that's especially I think is especially pertinent in shoulders and hips is one thing to keep in mind is that like our body thinks of movements, not muscles and specific joints or everything like that. Mm-hmm. So instead of working well, if I'm going into a shoulder flexion, is my are my muscles sinking or working in the exact proper way that they're supposed to or is there just a really gross inability to do that particular motion and if there is an inability to do that particular motion are we really able to absolutely nail it down to one or three one two or three particular tissues or are we better off just working on making our body being able to do that motion better Mm-hmm. And so, so when you're in you're interacting with patients now, are, mm-hmm. are they, are you finding they're, they're talking about muscles still? Cause I know that I still get that a lot in my clinic. It's, mm-hmm. they don't seem to, they say they can't reach overhead, but they equate it to one muscle being a problem. Yeah. Um, I haven't had that issue yet because in the few patients that I've had, they've all been students. So there's absolutely more than one muscle that's being the issue. Mm -hmm. It's like they come in and it's like, Oh my, I've been studying for the past whatever. And my entire back or my entire upper half of my body is sore. (laughs) So, uh, so far I haven't had that experience in talking to a pate, like into a patient in the clinic, but in talking with family members or stuff like that, you know, as an example, going overhead, it's like, oh, I can't go over my overhead. Like my lat is just like, or like the side of my body here. I think it's my lat. It's just killing me. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, that potentially could very well be your lat, but is it just because do, you, do we really have an inability for that muscle to lengthen or are you, is your body just not confident going in that overhead position because you don't, you don't really ever do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so when when you have when you have family talking about that and talking about their mm-hmm. lat, do you like how far do you do you allow them to or how far how far do you let it go where they just like keep talking about their lat before you just kind of like okay let's let's just let, let me put you that range and just let it let it happen yeah. you know <laughs> yeah um I kind of I think one thing that I want to I'm practicing with my family and I think is going to be one thing that I want to hopefully incorporate as I go down is I want 
it, again, this will probably be dependent on the person, but I want to kind of give them the opportunity to explain to me what they think is going on. Obviously, I don't want it to be a 15 to 30 minute explanation about why their lat is tight. Mm -hmm. But once they kind of give like this very, I want to give them the opportunity to kind of give their account of what's happening and then be able to have a conversation with them and actually hopefully have a whiteboard or something like that where I can actually like draw it down. It's like, well, you're maybe feeling it along the side of your body here while you're trying to go overhead, but really like it's not a muscle lengthening issue. Like research research has shown that that's not the issue that we're dealing with. It's more so actually a neurological issue for the most part where our body just is actually causing a contraction, not allowing our muscle to move in that way mm -hmm. because we, we don't, our body doesn't feel strong in that position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, I definitely think education is a good part in it. There's, um, uh, I, I tend to go, um, I, t I whatever, whatever terminology they, they tend to use, um, they should be mm -hmm. talking about their ladder piriformis or whatever the muscle muscle they think is the devil. Uh, mm -hmm. I kind of, I kind of pick up on that and, and, uh, I start using it in my conversation too. when I echo things back to them, but I'll start dropping okay. mine in too. Mm -hmm. Um, and usually what will happen is like I, I kind of play like middle ground and, and it's like, look, it could be the lat, it could be that, it could be something else. Mm -hmm. But you know what? The cool thing is that actually whatever we do today, if if I do something to your neck and your lat gets better, let's just mm -hmm. assume it's not your lat. It's something con yeah. connected there. And so um, I'm like, conversely, it might not work at all. You might be right. It might be a lat. And so yeah. you can kind of like, I tell them like, I'm not offended either way. It's, it's not like... Mm -hmm. I'm, pers I'm personally offended by what the diagnosis is, but um, I, I try to get, at least get them into the point where they they realize that that we're investigating together versus like yeah. I don't I don't want to argue with them about it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a I think that's a really good way of going about it, and probably something that I should take notes on and incorporate. <laughs> yeah, it's there's I think I think. Uh, um, I'm sure you're going to be, you're going to be really good, even better at communicating than, I mean, you're already better off than I am <laughs> where you're at in tournament, but thank you. Yeah. Um, but it, I, I think it took me, it took me years to even stop arguing with the person about what I thought it was. And it wasn't mm -hmm. that I was feeling, it wasn't that I was feeling like I was, I was trying to prove something. It was just like, I, I knew I felt what they were, were talking about was wrong, but it wasn't really a barrier for getting them better really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I guess there's no need to argue about things that won't really change the outcome. Yeah, it's, it, and I think when you have a lot of time, it's not a big deal. But if you're, mm -hmm. if you only got an hour with that person and they want to talk yeah. about it, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Kind of. Yeah. And that's kind of the, uh, I think that's going to be a really big difference in going back to the Canadian system opposed to the American system is that our, our service structure or even like our fee structure and everything is just set up in an interesting way where it almost it almost limits our time that we can kind of spend in the patient and spend with the patient mm -hmm. which is kind of it, i think it's kind of silly like they give these really kind of like blankets you can do as much of this as you want but you will only get this amount of money like you could do adjust their entire body you could do and their all of their body's adjustment is just one blanket hmm. just one blanket charge is is uh do you guys have to take the um the non non-free health care up there or whatever <laughs> the, uh, the no. celsius health care <laughs> <laughs> um you so the health care the health you can absolutely still do cash but even like your your cash charges are still kind of monitored by the um by your provincial board oh really yeah so let's just say you want to just head to toe you yeah. couldn't say that's three hundred dollars they'll say mm, the other guys are charging 45 to 55 can you can you charge something that is not monitored by like a, like a non-tangible like um you also gave him a piece of your hair when you adjusted him. That's two hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> the healing powers of the hair. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> is, um, is that not a lot? I mean, like you're selling because like that's nutri like nutritional. Like 
supplementation yeah. like it's different than adjusting right absolutely um I, I have to look uh, still a little bit further into it because I'm pretty sure like you can give additional charges, say like for uh, rehab exercises and uh, a few things like that. Or if you're using physiotherapy modalities, then you can increase those charges like five or ten dollars per usage, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if there's a uh, for sure charging code for the powers of healing hair or <laughs> crystals, but... <laughs> I can look into that. You can play nice music during which, or you can play really shitty music, and then the shitty yeah. music's free, but the nice music costs you two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, absolutely. And then if when while I'm shaving the hair, I could either <laughs> use like the really nice clippers, or just like bring out the like a old rusty hatchet and kind of go after it. <laughs> I thought you're gonna go with, with uh, tweezers. We're gonna just gonna tweeze <laughs> like one at a time. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I think that would just be worse for me than it was for them. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, gosh. Well, yeah, I want to play a game right here real quick then if we can. Um, yeah, absolutely. How, how much could we, if we we're going to like put together like a sandwich of, of charges for one chiropractic okay. visit in, in okay. Canada, Yeah. for a 30-minute session, what is the highest amount you can possibly like be reimbursed? Like, or not just from the healthcare system, but from the patient. Yeah. Like, what would that entail? So, so I'll touch on two points there. Um, the kind of the general charge, like if it was going to be a first patient visit, the kind of standard first patient visit that I've seen where I'm from uh, in Saskatchewan, it's kind of a 40, 45 minute first patient visit. And the charge will typically be about $85. Mm-hmm. Um, which obviously includes like history, physical um, some past patient health, family history, and like pers- the personal social. Um, and then after that, again, the kind of structure that I've seen where I'm from is your second visit include is going to be is going to be 30 minutes. It's going to include the review of findings and treatment, and kind of go from there. Uh, obviously, within that first visit, you're still going to get the treatment mm-hmm. um, as long as you don't have some crazy, ridiculous sy- symptoms going all the way down to your toes or something like that. You can't retreat ridicu- ridiculous in day one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess as long as they're not, as long as you're not uh, losing the functions of your bowel and bladder, then. Oh God! Then, okay, yeah, yeah, want, yeah okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my fault. I, I I just took the fix your own back course. I should know better than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You were just there. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. That was uh, that was a big showing there, wasn't it? Yeah, there was eighty some people there. It was great. It was great. Um, and then so as far as the as far as kind of like the reimbursement side of things, you kind of have two options. Uh, you can do the insurance game, or you can do cash. Um, and the cash. At this point in Canada, it's almost getting kind of silly to start to play the insurance game because with technology and everything like that, it's just becoming so easy to get reimbursed for, you know, paying, paying out of pocket. Um, my girlfriend just had her ACL re- uh, reconstructed uh, just about eight months ago. Mm-hmm. And the clinic that she went to for her rehab was cash based. And so she pays cash. She gets a receipt. She takes a picture of the receipt, uploads it to her to her bank's like online app or healthcare app, and she gets direct deposited like directly back into her checking account. Mm-hmm. So it's just becoming really straightforward mm-hmm. to just kind of take cash opposed to doing the I think it seems, insurance. I feel like it'd seem easier like with like even with working with, um, I feel like when people are, are paying cash, it's like, or if they hand it over a little bit, it's they, mm-hmm. even if they're going to get it back, like I feel like they, they take their, their recovery a little bit more seriously. You know, there's some skin in the game. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I a hundred percent agree with that. Mm-hmm. If you don't have to, if you don't have to at least give a, even like a temporary investment into the treatment that you're going through, mm-hmm. then you're not going to be as invested into everything that you're doing. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, so you, you were mentioning, talking about then the, the why behind what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Sure. Um, I have a couple, I have a couple stories that kind of go along with how I got directly involved into, uh, the chiropractic and kind of like physical, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, physical, uh, 
I guess, care world. Um, they're going to be slightly out of sequence, but I'll kind of go, I guess, in orders of like effectiveness. Um, so I used to play uh, university football at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I you know, got a few scholarship offers coming out of high school, decided to stay home and play football there. Finished my rookie season. And during, uh, during the winters, we would have uh, winter workouts and winter practices. It'd be an indoor stadium. And it was our last practice of the winter. And I had just a catastrophic knee injury. Um, like I tore my ACL, my LCL, my PCL, my arcuate ligament, my popliteal tendon, uh, both bicep femoris tendons. I destroyed the capsule of my knee and I ended up tearing my peroneal nerve as well. Mm, God. So, you know, like I, yeah, so it was brutal. The rehab kind of, it was to the point where it took me nine months to be fully walking again, like crutch free. Um, and it was kind of like a three and a half year long process of, you know, I was, when I got injured, I was 18 years old and dumb. It was like, ah, this doesn't matter. I'll get back and I can play football again. So three and a half years, almost four years later, I kind of completed my entire rehab process. I played one more season of football and slightly tore my medial meniscus and i decided that if it all if i continue playing and just continue injuring myself then that's probably not worth it mm -hmm. but that was really kind of like an eye-opening experience of to me at that point in time the whole physical rehab world wasn't necessarily on my radar at all it was very much you know i was looking at other areas as i had always been interested in movement and being active and working out but the actual care side of things, I never really experienced to obviously that extreme that I did when until I became seriously injured. And, you know, during that time, I absolutely understood the, you know, I was able to like firsthand experience the entire spectrum of, you know, the what injured athletes and injured people go through. And, you know, I went from being a very healthy, active, independent person to being you know, completely inactive, you know, I had, I've had three surgeries on that knee. After my first surgery, I was in the hospital for a week to manage pain. Uh, the pain was actually so like the, it was such a invasive surgery that actually following immediately following it, they, the surgeon didn't feel like normal painkillers would be enough. So they actually essentially gave me an epidural and just froze the entire lower half of my body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went from being completely active, independent, healthy to, you know, being inactive, bedridden, uh, dependence. Like my knee was locked at a 15 degree angle. So I couldn't, the only way I could fit into a vehicle was by lying sideways across the back seat. Uh, so I had to be driven everywhere. I had to rely on everybody to do anything. Like I was on crutches. It's always kind of difficult to to carry things or take care of yourself or to even, you know, to go long distances on your own. Mm -hmm. So I had to depend on everybody. And I, that also just kind of showed me the whole, how being physically active and, you know, healthy, how that completely kind of changes like the mental status of a patient, you know, and how, you know, it's, it really just comes down to that entire whole, it's essentially changing your life and what you've been used to for the past 18 years. In my case, just in the flick of a switch and all of a sudden everything that you're used to doing is just kind of turned upside down. And then having a good competent therapist, like rehab specialist on the other side, take, walking you through that process, encouraging you along the way and making sure that you're doing the right things at the right time in order to put yourself in the situation to be successful is a complete game changer. Like if I didn't have a, th a rehab specialist that I trusted in order to take me through that process, I wouldn't have made it back to play football again in those three and a half years. Like it's still, 
it took me forever, but that was a, you know, that's a knee issue, not a, not a rehab issue. Mm -hmm. So if I feel like if people aren't in a situation to have those, those very talented and educated specialists to take them through that journey, then a lot of people are just going to, they're just going to let their injuries and their, I guess, limitations define them and not really battle through in order to be, in order to become, you know, back better to where they were uh, prior to that injury. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I know. So you you've had the, exp- uh, I guess, fortunate nature to be, a, be a patient with a, with a long-term problem now. Um, not, mm-hmm. not everybody gets that, that chance, not that you necessarily want it, but, yeah. but it's tough. Um, but I think you're right. Like it, it's, it's nice to be able to be the person and guide the person, but mm-hmm. as the patient on, on that side, um, how much were you willing to trust that provider or a different provider or like, what was the tipping point where you decided that person was the one who was going to help you? Uh, for me, I, I don't have a great answer to that question because my, choice of provider was kind of given to me because there was a there was a physiotherapist and uh kind of like therapy team directly associated with the football team Mm -hmm. so and i've had you know i've had a few minor injuries in the past you know with playing football you know you don't kind of you rarely go through a season with nothing going wrong and it was i guess throughout those kind of periods of those minor injuries where you can kind of just sit back and listen to how she interacted with her patients and interacted with the football team that you understand how intelligent and smart that she was, that it was very easy for me to trust her in doing and giving me and taking me along the journey that I needed to go on to, you know, get back to where I wanted to be. Oh, good. So, so she, so she got your trust with, um, with her knowledge at that point and carrying yeah. it, I'm guessing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the, the only reason I I'm asking is because there's, it's, uh, you weren't, I guess I wouldn't consider you a chronic pain person. You were, you were athletic. You had a good mental mindset about it. But when, um, I know some people, when they've gone through multiple people, they, mm-hmm. they're, they're skittish, I guess in a way mm-hmm. and, and they jump. And the, the, the tough thing is, that in those situations is nobody gets to to help guide this person because they keep jumping to somebody new and you know develop a good long term relationship with them you know yeah absolutely but but it I sounded like that, you had a good one in the in the beginning there yeah I was very fortunate that I did have a good one you know a, a good physiotherapist from the get go to kind of take me along and you know keep battling through where I to where I needed to get to and very fortunate. Like, you know, obviously throughout my injury, there are points in time where I wasn't the easiest patient to deal with because, you know, I'm always, I'm always going to be a stubborn football player. That's just how things go. But, you know, she had to deal with that. You know, she was there for 10 plus years. So she's, she knew exactly what that entailed and exactly how to handle all the shit that I was giving her. So it was perfect. Mm-hmm. You guys still trade uh, Christmas cards? I I go and visit her as much as I can when I go back home. Uh, I send her a set of flowers every now and then. Oh, so nice! Like, it's yeah. I I feel like there's there you might not have gotten it yet. I mean, but I feel like you've experienced it from the patient side now. Is that I think there's a there's a relationship that sticks and there's like a fondness for that person who helps you through that thing. Um, Absolutely. So it's, I think as, as we get more patience and, and you experience more patience, you'll probably find a couple who are just like, like think you're just a God, like you're the best because you help them through something, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, you know, like you said, I definitely found that in mine, in my, uh, physical therapist while I was going through that. And, you know, I think that that's a very special relationship to potentially build with someone that, you know, it's it's not a very common thing that a lot of people can experience because it, like I said, it's very special and unique when you're building a relationship between yourself and whether you're on the patient side or the doctor side and someone who's guiding you through, you know, one of the more difficult times in their lives. Yeah. Yeah. And and I don't know if, um, 
like if if the listeners haven't experienced like uh, like an event like yours it's mm-hmm. i think it's hard to to understand that from that side because it's just like it's just another day at the office you know for most people and you don't really think about what that person's going through and and that you are a, a important guy in that pivotal like it's a tough point real tough point yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's, it definitely makes me excited to you know be on the guiding side of of the patients that i have the you know privilege of interacting with yeah well i bet i bet too if you um i mean i typically share with with, with patients then begin if i see that they're I see that they're not necessarily reluctant, but like I want to break the ice is is like I want to get on their level a little bit and just just let them know I've I've been there too. And so mm-hmm. I, I bet if you share that with your people, like you probably won't even have to explain anything. Just like they're gonna be like, oh, this guy's been through it. I get it, you know, or he yeah. gets it. And it's yeah. a good trust thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I can definitely break the ice in a few different ways. Like I still. Um, I still carry a foot drop with me. Like I had a nerve graft done to try to repair my peroneal nerve. Um, but, you know, nerves are finicky on the wall and the heel as much as they do. So I I still have a little bit of a foot drop and my friends at school here will ever so lovingly call me flipper. <laughs> <laughs> and I will trip on a flat sidewalk at any point in time. So. I can definitely predict myself tripping into a treatment room during throughout my career rather frequently. Yeah. Well, at least they call you flipper, not tripper. <laughs> well, I hope they don't <laughs> listen to this because now they're probably going to change that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, uh, I, I kind of wish that I had, uh, I had every type of condition for one day. Yeah. And then it would just go, <laughs> go away. <laughs> Yeah, they experience one. Yeah, get experience everything at least once, so that you know what people are going through. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, who would you? What condition do you feel like you would want to specialize in if you had to pick a couple? Anyways, I guess. Oof. Football knees. Uh, honest. So actually, even though I was a football player, I'm actually really aiming towards uh, working with the gen pop. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like. It's just some there. The general population is just a, you know, a market of people that I I don't want to say need a lot of help, but are uh, they're a population of people who are constantly trying to improve themselves and aren't always necessarily exposed to the proper information. Right, I can agree with that. So, and this just kind of epitomize. Um, you, we started talking on Instagram, obviously, and there was someone back from my hometown who messaged me. And was, sorry, I noticed on their uh, Instagram feed that they said that they were unable to work out for a few weeks. And I just looked and it was, I sent them a message. It's like, hey, what's going on? Like, why can't you work out? And she's like, oh, um, I've been having some foot pain for a while. So I went to go see my uh, primary care physician. And I was diagnosed with uh, plantar fasciitis, and I was told I can't work out for at least three weeks. <laughs> I was just like, "Oh no!" Like, uh, like I, you know, and this just kind of epitomizes everything that I feel about it because, you know, I'm sure I don't know how many people know, but plantar fasciitis is a garbage diagnosis at the best of times. With you know, maybe only you know, 5% of people actually diagnosed with it truly have injury to their plantar fascia. Mm -hmm. And then to say to someone who is trying to, trying to improve their health, trying to like work hard in order to be healthier and more fit, you know, like this particular individual was really big into doing the boot camps and everything like that. Um, would I have recommended that she continue to do the boot camps? Probably, probably not. Like, I think that um, just looking at her particular health journey, I think that she probably needed a little bit more of the strength training side and like really working on that stability before, you know, getting into those really dynamic movements. But to completely just take her out and say, you can no longer be active yeah. because of this thing that you have going on in your foot. I 
that is not a very legitimate diagnosis just kind of hurt me on many levels yeah yeah it yeah i feel you the uh <laughs> I, I think it's i think it's ridiculous to like to it's disabling somebody is basically what's yeah. it, like disabling and deconditioning yeah. and mm-hmm. like i i don't quite understand the 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 whole like you hurt a foot and so i can't do like oh i, I can't do x y and Z. I can't do any resistance training yeah. at least and it's like mm-hmm. what is a what does a foot got to do with it um, yeah. even if it really was plantar fasciitis, which probably not, um, yeah. she can, she can still sca- like, I think scaling things back and maybe like if, if she would understand that just because you can't squat doesn't mean you, or, uh, say deadlift on that, mm-hmm. maybe you can do a hip hinge or maybe you can do yeah. like a barbell hip thruster. Maybe yeah, you can go half exactly. kneeling, tall kneeling. It's just, it's just crazy. Yeah, there's so many options. This and this actually goes really well into the other thing that that I mentioned I wanted to talk about. It's the whole idea of people are getting scared to not to tell people not to do things. It's like, well, it's not just telling people not to do things. It's maybe avoiding that particular provocative activity, but then replacing it with something that still works and is still good, but just is slightly more tailored to their current abilities while you work back up to getting them into there so you know as a classic example is well is she trying to do strict overhead presses or push presses without being able to unload it get her hand directly above her head Mm -hmm. well if not we probably shouldn't load that but that doesn't mean that we can't put her in front of a landmine Mm -hmm. and have her do push presses there yeah yeah, I totally agree. Or even just expose your toe overhead in like a like a downward dog position, push the floor away kind of like like there's no reason yeah. to like strip the entire movement unless maybe for a couple of days, but after that like yeah. you got to start loading it a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was kind of thinking recently about the uh the, we had me and me and Dmac did a we did a whole shoulder module, upper quarter module for loading and Yeah, yeah. And so we are um we were kind of talking about where a lot of it was overhead. And mm-hmm. so think, you know, people are told like at, at a certain point, they're like, you should not lift five pounds over your head ever again. And these people continue to have shoulder pain after that. Jeez. It's yeah. like, can you, I was thinking about like, you know, like if you can't go overhead, you don't, you don't really drive in the lower trap, uh, middle trap serratus. Like you kind of lose a lot. And it seems like Absolutely. the upper trap levator seems to chill down an overhead position. Mm-hmm. And so is it perpetuating the problem by telling them not to do anything overhead? You know? Pro- yeah, probably a little bit. I guess. <laughs> as long like as long as I think you know, one thing to make sure as well is that people actually know how to get overhead because a lot of people are like, "Well, I can't get my arms overhead. I don't know what to do." But that's because throughout their entire like workout time, everybody has been telling them to keep their shoulder blades back and in their back pocket. And they're not actually teach them that the shoulder blade is needs to be mobile and stable in different positions, and it needs to work around your rib cage in order to allow you to get overhead without just impinging everything. Yeah, yeah. We should do a whole podcast series on the dumb things that that people still <laughs> still believe, like not in a demeaning way, but it's like stop, stop, yeah. stop believing that, please. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Like the knee pass it's, toe thing. I think we've been beyond that for a yeah. long time, but people still yeah. hang on to that. Oh, and social media is just a hot spot for that. Like how many times will you see in the comment section of any activity posts like, oh, you're squatting with your knees past your toes. That's not healthy for you. <laughs> it's like, well, uh, come if, you know, if they have an outrageous meniscal injury, then maybe we want to limit the amount of direct stress that we put on a knee. But like, other than that, I feel like everything you need to do is as long as it, you know, as long as it's, as long as they have the ability to do so, do it. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, um, it, it, what we should probably cover here, just in case, like, I don't want to assume the listeners know what we're talking about. Um, I think it's fair to say that, so, um, if you have a problem, um, say, with your knee in a certain direction, you take the direction away for a first aid period of time, and then you reintegrate. It doesn't mean you can't do it ever again. And so, mm-hmm. 
um, if you haven't had this conversation with your patients, I, I think you should. Um, one of the common things that I think people get it with that I've seen people come in is they, they bending forward for their lumbar spine feels like the devil. And then they don't do that anymore and they end up with a ridiculous symptom. So uh, having that conversation about reintegration, and I, I literally say this about three, four times to my patients throughout the first examination. To be clear, mm-hmm. this is a first aid. Do not leave a Band-Aid on your skin for the rest of your life. Please come back yeah. and we'll, we'll take the first aid away. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, touching on that lumbar flexion is also a really good one too because, yeah, if you're coming in with a low back injury for a little bit, just for a little bit, like we're going to change your movement strategies to make sure, you know, as like the classic Philip Snell is like, we don't want to continuously pick the scab of something healing. So like, let's just like change your movement strategy for a little bit, give everything some time to heal. We're going to teach you a hip hinge. We're going to teach you how to deadlift. We're still going to teach you how to be strong. And then once all of your symptoms are going away and once we have managed that, then move however your body so chooses. Yeah. And I think the discussion too with uh, with or without accessory load is or weight training, I think one. is an important conversation with all, with all these absolutely. joints. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, that's a very prominent conversation to have as well because I, again, I've mentioned that I kind of fell into like the whole DNS side of things, which I really enjoy. And one of the things that uh, I took the weightlifting uh, portion of DNS from uh, Dr. Richard Alm, and his big thing is when we're going into a lift, you want to brace yourself as much as you need, but as little as possible. So when you're adding external load, that's when having your joints centrated into where the load is going to be managed over all of the tissues surrounding that joint is important. Like if you're going to be loading your spine with a note with a barbell squat or something like that, flexion or extension over loading one side of those tissues is not going to be beneficial for you. Mm-hmm. Or same thing with that overhead press or anything like that. But again, you know, without external load, you know, you don't need a constant, you don't need a deadlift or do a perfect hinge in order to pick up the napkin from the floor that you dropped while you're making, you know, while you're making dinner. Right, unless you're flexion intolerant, <laughs> and then, then you scale, then you add it back, and then you add it back again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, exactly. There's, there's a time and place for movement modification, and, and that's what I mean. That that's the realm that we live in as as I guess movement practitioners. You just have to you guide them through it, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, as we start to. We're going to start to wrap up pretty soon. We've been talking for a little bit. This has been 48 minutes now, I think. Oh, not bad. I know. We've gotten to some good stuff there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you a couple of questions about uh, I need to learn something from you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so um, I, I know since you've heard the other the other ones, uh, the other student interviews, the reason why I want to start conducting them is because I want to hear um, hear from the listeners and, and learn about what the other side is thinking about this uh, this forum um, and mm-hmm. how it can improve the podcast and all that kind of jazz. So, um, I guess start out with, um, what, what is working for you by listening to this podcast and what is not working? Well, for me, it's going to be a lot easier to answer what is working. Um, cause I think your last student interview kind of touched on this. It's, I think it was Hannah that I listened to and she kind of called this like media learning or something along those lines, I believe. Mm-hmm. And I, I was listening to a different podcast, or I think I, maybe I was listening to an audio book, and I for, I completely forget who the exact author was. But you know, we are at a time where information can be so readily available to us that we can be in our car driving, um, you know, driving to work, driving back home, driving to just get groceries or anything like that. And we have so much information readily available to us. And it, so with the amount of information that we have, we can just constantly expose ourselves to that information that we want to be able to, you know, become masters with. And you take that amount of hours that you need to spend to become a master at something. And now you don't just need to spend those minutes or hours at school or studying. 
that you can optimize your time and listen to a podcast on your way to work, on your way to school, you know, while you're cleaning your kitchen or anything like that. So if we can just expose ourselves to an additional hour per day while listening to a podcast like this, we're just going to decrease the amount of time that we need in order to become a master at our skill. Nice. The uh, What are some of the other podcasts you listen to that, that you'd suggest? Um, I've, I've been diving into uh, Kevin Christie's podcasts mm-hmm. um, about uh, chiropractic marketing, um, which I think you know, I, the whole like marketing business side of things can't be forgotten about our particular profession. Um, you know, especially there's going to be the treatment side of things and there's going to be the business side of things. And if you can't, if you don't have a thriving business, then you're not going to be able to have, you know, you're, then you're not going to be, you're not going to have a full office full of people or you're not going to be able to have the opportunity to train people to, train more people to have associates with you in order to help more people, you know, make, make their way through their injuries and live their best lives. Um, I've also kind of been diving into just healthcare in general podcasts, the Kyle Kingsbury podcast from on it. Um, it's kind of a, it can be interesting at times. You kind of have to pick and choose the people that you listen to. Um, but (laughs) you've turned off some (laughs) of them halfway, haven't you? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, there's been like there's, but there's been a few ones that are absolute, like just absolute gold, as well. Um, where you know you can listen to guys like Ben Greenfield and who have pretty much take natural medicine because they're, you know, as wealthy as they are, they can take natural medicine and buy anything that they could ever dream of in order to essentially nearly live like. A, caveman in modern society and say well Mm -hmm. if you're you know take diving i've been reading books about like the whole like evolutionary evolutionary biology approach to just being healthy it's like man if we could halfway live like cavemen for 90 percent of our day that wouldn't be too bad (laughs) right you mean you mean cavemen didn't uh, eat stuff out of styrofoam containers Sadly, not. No, the antelope <laughs> didn't have. They didn't pack their Tupperware with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. I've I've the, heard that one actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's that. It's a pretty good podcast, and I th- he's also had I think Mark uh, Ruscio about uh, like probiotics and stuff like that on there, which is you know the whole idea of gut health is also becoming a lot more prevalent today. Mm-hmm. So there's. You can definitely listen to some big names on that podcast. It's a pretty good one. Cool. Yeah, there's there's a, there's a few podcasts that I, that I've heard where intermittently I like to to listen to them, and it's really selective. Uh, mm-hmm. And like some people are just really good interviewers. I just learn I learn a lot personally just from, from hearing people ask questions. So yeah, for sure, getting information out of people. Mm-hmm. Um, the Clinic Gym Radio has also been one that I've been diving into. You know, I've I've heard of people liking that one. I haven't heard that's Saddle, Saddleys, right? Yes, yes, yes. I I I heard him talking on somebody else's podcast before, but I haven't I've not heard the I haven't heard his actual podcast yet. I'll, I will though. I'll listen to it. Yeah, it's it's a good one to just kind of change the to to look at the uh, different model that you can kind of bring into your clinic and then you know get that recurrent income from memberships and everything like that it's an interesting idea to think about mm-hmm. the um just just thought on that because i we my interns were talking about this the other the other day was mm-hmm. that um so we have we have people come in here that that they, they they're i would i call them conditioning clients like they still have a little bit of things here and there that aren't that big mm-hmm. they're definitely not lit up but they come back for for programming and instruction and coaching, mm-hmm. and so he, uh, one of the interns yesterday, had he said, uh, he's like, how come you don't suggest everybody come back for that? You only have some people, and, and I'm like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to seem salesy with it, and like it's not, I'm like, my mm-hmm. my income is not dependent upon these these people because um, I have new patients coming in, and based upon the interaction we have with them, it's or I, if I have with them, if I see the potential to make them um, independent, and if they have you know, bags at home, old Jansport backpacks, and they have tools, and they're willing to walk around the neighborhood and look like a fool doing yeah. carries. I, I want them to, that's, what I, that's the ideal environment. But if they're not going to do that, I look at it as an opportunity to to nurture good habits. And 
one day a week, one day every two weeks, and attempt to get them into that lifestyle. But mm-hmm. that's why I would use more of a, so I guess we kind of do it like a gym clinic setting, but there, there's not a membership model with the mm-hmm. gym. It's just uh, one-on-one, two-on-one coaching in an effort to get yeah. them out, you know? Yeah. That's kind of something similar to, I guess, what I envision my clinic having is once I'm able to afford to have a few uh, like kinesiologists or, you know, kinesiology grads and stuff like that to be able to almost have near personal training, like one on one or two on one coaching where we're still able to get everything, the proper movement patterns and to, like you said, to get them independence Mm -hmm. in their own in their health. Cause like once we teach them, you know, how to hinge, hinge squat, push, pull, carry, you know, safely and in a great way for their body type and their anatomy mm-hmm. and they, then they can take that and they can go do their thing elsewhere. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people too, if they, I mean, if they've been feeling like if they're gen pop or athletes or whatever, like it's sometimes it's, it's easy to forget that like how good, how good it feels to feel good. And yeah they're in pain so long and they finally get out of pain and all of a sudden they hit that realm where they're they're just like i feel so good i don't want it to come back and they think that non-movement or non-loading is a solution and so there's there's a guiding process needed in there and they might only have trust in you because you're that guide Mm -hmm. and they don't have trust in your other recommendation your strength coach or your trainer and so i think that hand holding is required i think yeah absolutely Absolutely. I agree. Um, I want to ask you too, is just my own personal knowledge. It, sure. uh, is there anything on this podcast where you thought, Hey, uh, I'm going to start using that in my, in, uh, when I become a clinician, cause, uh, I want to see what points are really sticking with people. And, uh, mm-hmm. I want to see if I'm making a change really. Um, the most recent one that came to mind is, uh, Speaking of Dr. D. Mac, when your most recent uh, interview with him, uh, talking about like the loading and your kind of pro series and everything like that, I pretty much that entire just listening to that entire podcast was like this is very relevant and f- like for the majority of patients that we're going to be dealing with and being able to manage load and like how to reincorporate it back into their daily life. Yeah, cool. I think that's the most recent one that comes to mind. It was, yeah, it's been a little, it's been, I haven't been able to listen to many podcasts recently. It's been hectic trying to get, well, get ready for the clinic and everything like that. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm glad you like that. I, I really, I really hope people like the loading ones, actually the loading conversations. Um, mm-hmm. I, I kind of think like we were, we were, me and DMAC were talking off air about, I mean, I guess we did talk about on air with it is too, is that, you know, what percentage of our profession or even PTs have, you know, adequate loading strategies um, yeah. and, and just a purposeful one. And, and we don't think it's a majority and it's kind of sad because we could yeah. be that intermediate. Um, and it's not too hard to learn. You just got to learn. You got to know where to learn it from. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's, you know, and being able to do that well is kind of a game changer for the type of care that you can give your patient yeah the i mean we're really good at passive care i think but um passive Mm -hmm. care nurtures dependence yeah yeah absolutely we need to kind of find like the happy medium of giving them the tools that they need to succeed that where they can do it back at home Mm -hmm. and throughout their daily life and then when they come into clinic giving them the bits and pieces that they can't quite do all the time on their own where they need an external hand to just kind of nudge them in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Um, by, by the way, for everyone listening, that pro series that he mentioned, uh, it's probably going to not be last week anymore. It's going to be like a month and a half ago. So oh, let's right, dig right, backwards. Yeah. Um, is there anything you want to ask me before we actually start to clean up here? You can, um, you can take the mic. <laughs> oh, I think actually as we kind of, as we kind of talked along any questions that I had throughout the conversation, you kind of answered as we were going. So I don't think I really have any outstanding questions that I need to get answered right now. Okay. Uh, how can everyone reach you? I know you're mainly Instagram, right? Yes. So I do have an Instagram page. It's 
at E3 Mobility. Um, you can also find me on, on the internet. My website is e3mobility.com. And yeah, if you can find me there, you can uh, ask me any questions that you feel and I'll do what I can to push you in the right direction. When, when, when people reach out to you, what, Mm -hmm. what should they, what should they start the conversation with that would really wow you? Like talking about tacos or (laughs) I'm a, I'm a big fan of steak and dogs. (laughs) <laughs> not dogs not dog steaks though not not dog steak the two <laughs> the two are very separate but if you were to show me a picture of a nice steak that you were eating with a dog sitting at a chair across the table <laughs> we could <laughs> maybe with a napkin uh, around its neck then we could talk for hours oh man <laughs> okay i can see a whole like so you, you should have a side instagram feed just dog <laughs> dogs and steak napkins Oh, dogs eating steak. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't. I don't know if I could part with a steak to give to a dog. Like, I, don't, I know they would love it, but I think I would just love it more. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but the happiness of you watching the dog eat the steak might be better than the taste of the steak itself. I, I suppose I could share. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thanks so much for being on. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's a great experience, Curtis. Thanks so much for being on. That was great. Good to meet you finally. I know we've been uh, texting back and forth on on Instagram a little bit, but um, I feel like it, I've known you for a long time and, and watched you move on Instagram. That's E three Mobility, but uh, we haven't really spoken. So good to finally meet you. Now, um, everybody, again, if you have not already, please subscribe to the podcast. And if you have not done this yet, please share this with another student. If you are a student. What I really want to occur from this podcast, if you kind of don't get the gist already from uh, interviewing Curtis, is that I want to change the profession. Like, I really love to. I I think our profession can always strive to do better. And so I really challenge people with uh, a little bit of thinking and uh, different types of knowledge on this podcast. So uh, I think if we don't continue learning, then we're, we're just... We're dead in the tracks, man. We just got to gotta keep learning. And I've learned a lot through interviewing people on this podcast. And uh, I feel like I've really developed over the last couple of years. So if you want to follow along that journey with me, please subscribe to the podcast. There's about 150 different, different episodes prior to this one that are going to be loaded full of clinical gems as well as entertainment. So uh, please share this with a colleague. Uh, I do mean that. Uh, I mean that you need to share it. Like, I want you to share it. Like, the biggest favor you can do to me as the host of this podcast, who gets literally nothing paid on this podcast, is just a passion project. Um, the best thing you can do to repay me is to share it with a friend. Currently, we're sitting at a stagnant good about uh, 1,500 downloads per episode. I think we can double that easily. I think by the next couple months, I don't see why we can't be doing at least 3,000 uh, listeners to per podcast. And if you do that, I'll tell you, you know what? The cool thing is I'll be able to get even better guests because here's what happens on the side is that sometimes I've inter- I've asked a couple people if they would share their knowledge on this podcast and they kind of ask, like, I understand it because they're busy people, they ask what your numbers are. And so I can leverage a little bit more if you guys help me get the numbers up. So please do that for me. Lastly, if you've not already, please go to the Pro Cairo uh, Online CE website. That's Pro Cairo Online CE. That is where we put all the information that I spoke about with Curtis, um, or he mentioned that we have Dr. Mac there, we have uh, Dr. Ben Ramos there, we have G- Philip Snell, we have Greg Lemon, uh, we have uh, coming up in, in the other modules, we actually have uh, Michael Shacklock uh, coming on board for Neurodynamics and Guido Van Reisigen. So I've interviewed uh, all these people already. And so uh, please go on there and, and just investigate. And quite honestly, the first 10 minutes of every module is, is free. We cover flexion and tolerant backs. And in module two, eventually, which won't be out by the time of this podcast, uh, we're cover- covering upper quarter cervical spine types of complaints. So if you're really not good at shoulders or necks or ridiculous symptoms or shoulder blades, though, we're going to cover it in that. If you don't feel very confident getting people to feel really good after about a couple days or even the first day, with um, with discogenics types of symptoms, with not being able to touch your toes, with not being able to put on their shoes, rolling out of bed, getting out of cars, like sneezing, coughing. These things are um, very, very manageable without even really even doing too many manual therapy, like really not much at all. Like I, I, I'm honest with you, 
I don't really do any manual care on these uh, on these on these back cases. The first probably three times I see them, and so a lot of it is just um, movement based corrections and loading, providing a safety net, and so it provides a lot of uh, confidence. If you go through that module, please do because it is game is a game changer if you don't feel confident in it. So check it out. That is Pro Cairo Online CE. Again, if you do go through that, I am a partner in that, and I approve all of the information that is made. Now, as always, lead people better than how you found them. And if you're dating, date an Eagle Scout because they're usually kind of honest. I'll talk to you guys soon.